things that uh, we just saw from Mad Men were actually based on our agency in New York. Uh, they were they were sort of the, uh, the agency that uh, inspired much of that um, crazy show. Um, and this worked for a very, very long time. Um, and what I want to talk to you about today is changing a creative culture by taking risks, um, not being afraid to fail, uh, and trying some very, very new things. So this is, uh, this created in 63. Worked for a very long time. Um, I decided to take over the job of Chief Creative Officer of Gray in 2007. Right before I started, Marketing Week wrote this about the agency, Gray by name, Gray by nature. A couple months later, had me wrote this uh, right before I started at Gray. Gray's game is over. Um, so it's not, not good to be joining an agency when you read this in the press right before you start. Um, and the problem was the media landscape was changing. We all know this, it's all cliche by now. But uh, the, the agency was not changing um, as fast as, as the, the landscape was. Um, and so when I started, um, we looked at sort of the history of the company. And the one thing that, that Gray had done very, very well was they were very uh, protective. What they hadn't done well was good creative. Uh, the creative was bad, actually. Um, and so we realized that what we needed to do in this new landscape was we had to uh, create famous work. So we, like any, like you do with any of our clients, we gave ourselves a North Star, a mantra. And it's right there on the, the, uh, the logo here. Famously effective. The place has been around for almost 100 years. Um, so we needed to add fame to some of that effective part because that's what it takes in today's media landscape. You need to create work that people are talking about. Um, I'm gonna, I wouldn't normally show this, but this is, a, this is actually a, a three minute film. Um, and, and probably, we've, believe it or not, we've won out of 77 of our last 92 pitches of Gray, um, which is a pretty good record. And, the, and, and I think one of the main reason is the work. The second most important reason is the film I'm about to show you. It's three minutes when we pitch a piece of business, all we do is show this, and we don't say another thing about our agency, not one word. If they want to ask us questions, we'll answer them. But this is all we ever show, because I think it's all we need to show. And this is what we call Three Minute Gray. And if you think about the Don Draper picture from 63 that I showed you, this is a little bit of a different agency that we're selling now. Welcome to Three Minute Gray. OK, let's begin with a brief history of advertising agencies. There are typically two kinds, those who make famous work and those who make effective work, and they're the two shall the artists and the accountants, the freaks and the geeks. But at Gray, we do both famous and effective, and we have them for 95 years because we believe in making our clients remarkable and really rich. Really? Prove it. Okay, see this dude? We fought him. Then he kicked on the Super Bowl and quickly found himself in just about every major news program, blog, magazine, newspaper, and website in America. Forty million in two views later, he was voted the best ad campaign two years in a row by the Wall Street Journal and just helped E trade in the best year of the company's history. Famous and effective. Next, PG needed to help dusting off one of their beauty brands and bam, bum rush pop culture with easy, easy, beautiful Wait a minute, Ellen, Drew, Queen Latifah, not exactly your expected teenage mom shows, but these ladies bucked the category norm and CoverGirl has grown to become America's largest cosmetics brand. Okay, great, okay, wait, let's go hair and let's go global. One message, one look, one feel everywhere. Take a tiny $12 million shampoo born out of medical science and make it shine. The result, a $3 billion global phenomenon, Pantene. Now that's some crazy sexy hair, people shake it, shake it. Now for some man stuff, NFL style. A whole season of ads with no players and no football? What? Are you crazy? No, we're just going to show the fans all year long. Top it off with Super Bowl spots are in Seinfeld, Homer, and the Fonz, and you've got the NFL's single most successful season in the history of the league. Highest TV viewership ever, and record sales for all 11 business units. Famous, effective. Okay. All right, how about retail in a declining segment? Fret not, young Padua, when you're here, you're family. Olive Garden arrived at Gray with just a handful of restaurants. Now they got 650 locations in over 14 straight years of consecutive growth. Hands down, the most successful casual dining store in history. Thought never ending breadsticks were impressive? Well, actually they are, but can you say erectile dysfunction? We can with pride. Drum roll, please, for Seattle's one cup of two tubs of the single most recalled image in pharmaceutical advertising. 75% unaided awareness and the fastest growing brand in the category, domestically and around the world. Famously effective, oh daddy, yes it is. Speaking of hot brands, here's one for you. Don't just watch TV, direct TV. This tagline in the insanely cinematic ad surrounding it completely repositioned direct TV as the premium television provider in America. Soon the Russian billionaire and his mini giraffe, Charlie Sheen, and some guy who ended up in a roadside ditch had the Huffington Post and CNBC crediting this campaign as a major reason for direct TV stock being all time highs. Personally, my favorite ad in the United States was those ads.
encouraging people to switch from uh, cable to direct TV. We're also socially conscious, which is why we're the exclusive agency partner of the Tech Conference, helping them market their mind-bending and world-changing ideas from people like Al Gore, Bill Gates, and Fauna. As long as we're name-dropping, Greg was just named along with Facebook, Apple, and Google as one of the 50 most innovative companies in the world by Fast Company Magazine. Okay, maybe there is something to this famously effective thing. So just for kicks, let's go old school. They down a few tracks off of Gray's Grids, Hits LP, or 8-Track, or whatever the case was when these were born. Gray Hunt, the driving to us. The Kool-Aid Man, Calvin, and Take Me Away, the Downy Drop, and Choosy Moms, Choose Jiff. And guess what? We were even the first to put a woman in a bra on TV for Playtex. So who are we? 1,000 passionate, innovative minds in our New York headquarters, not to mention 10,000 employees in 150 cities around the globe. Here's a comfy thought. One quarter of the Fortune 100 are our clients. And we don't dig one night stands so our client relationships are eight times longer than the industry average. What we do dig is create effective, iconic ideas that sustain a long burn for years and even decades. And we've been doing it since 1917, and that's a long time. This is a long video. Our three minutes is up. The end. I'm sure you guys find this all the time. You end up pitching business, you end up talking about yourself for 45 minutes. No client wants to hear you talk about yourself for 45 minutes. So we talk about ourselves for three minutes and we never say another word. And it sort of tells the story. Um, in that time, from 2007, when it said Gray's game is over, in our New York office, we were about 380 at the time. We're about 1,100 now. So there's been a lot of growth um, and a lot of new business in that time. So the thing I really want to talk about is culture and creative culture and a risk-taking um, so when you get to that size, how can you keep a creative culture going? How can you infuse creativity um, in everything you do? Um, because there's actually a very interesting study that was done by IBM, and I think for everyone in this room, it's really important. Uh, and it's, in, it's actually very optimistic, I think. So IBM did a study a couple of years ago, and they asked 1,500 of the world's top CEOs what the most important leadership competency of the future is. It's a pretty big question. The answer, number one, was creativity. I mean, think about that. 10 years ago, there was no way that the top leadership competency in the business would be creativity. The world is completely changing, um, and the business world is especially changing. Uh, and creativity is it's, it is such a premium right now, um, which makes me feel very good about our business. I think it's the best time to be in the business. So how do you take that creativity and make sure you infuse it through your agency every single day? Um, here's one of the things we do. Seems like a small thing, but if there's one thing you take away from this talk, you should do this in your agency or in your business. Uh, every single Thursday from 9 to noon, you cannot have a meeting with Greg. Our clients know this. Everybody in the agency knows this. It's on, it's on everybody's calendar. It's blocked out. You cannot have a meeting from 9 to noon on every single Thursday. It's only three hours, but you would not believe how much we get done with great creative ideas we come up with in this time, because that's time that you walk into the office every Thursday morning, and you know that's your time. Nobody else can have that time but you. That is nurturing the creative spirit. It's helpful time. Um, one of the things that came out of this is this year we were the first agency um, in history to be shortlisted at the Academy Awards um, with a program we did for Canon called Project Imagination. I'm not going to show it to you today, but if you ever get a chance, it's a pretty cool program. It was shortlisted. The, the film we made was shortlisted at the Academy Awards. We also won the Emmy this year, also for Canon, a very different uh, assignment from Canon, um, and of course you probably know there's only one Emmy given every year. We won it this year with the spot I'm about to show you.
the insight there, speaking to photographers, um, is just really, really tight. The strategy there is, is and it doesn't hurt that many like we get shooting films, because that's a beautiful spot. Um, second um, thing I want to talk about, so this is, this is called the Heroic Failure Award. We started giving this award out five years ago at Gray. When you win this award, you get your name etched in it, and it's yours until the next person wins it, they get their next the name etched in it. Only seven people have won this in five years, which means this award at Gray is more valuable than a gold mine at camp. Because less people have won this at Gray than have won a gold mine at camp. So this is something that we take very seriously. So what is a heroic failure? Most businesses punish risk-taking. That hurts the creative process. If you know you're going to get punished for taking a risk for doing something outside the lines, you're probably not going to do it. When you're in a creative business, the best ideas come from people that are thinking outside the lines. Um, so we reward that, even if it's a failure. Um, even if you have this idea, and it's a wonderful idea, uh, and you present it, it bombs. America hates it. The public hates it. You lose a client. Um, if we really believe in that idea, even though it fails, we give you this award. It's a real failure. So, um, the Wall Street Journal actually put this award on the cover uh, of, uh, of their paper. And I love what they said about it. Um, they talked all about the award and what it meant for our culture. And the headline is, Better Ideas Through Failure. Um, I think they, they summed it up better than I ever could. I think that's exactly what it's for. What I always say about failure is, though, fail fast. <laughs> you know, those long, suspended failures, not so good. Um, so fail fast, learn from your mistake, make it better next time. Um, I want to show you this. This is just a stupid little internal thing that happened to us in Cam a couple years ago. But uh, I think it's a great example of failing fast. The advertising agency tagline, illusory, mysterious, useless, worthless, except ours because it is awesome. Everyone and everyone to know, Cam 2011. 20,000 of the world's most influential people in advertising have assembled. What did we do? We flew a plane showcasing our tag. Bravery, famously, a bet. Fuck! The blogosphere and Twitterverse exploded. Some called it genius. Others labeled it an embarrassment. Agency Spy picked it up, and Brand Republic called it the mother of all screws. Most people were hating, but at least they were talking. So screw it. We added fuel to the fire. We publicly threw the person responsible for the title under the bus. Administrative assistant Holly Eva DeWares, a fictitious patsy we created to take the fall, complete with fake Facebook and LinkedIn profiles. Her name, an anagram of that other famous patsy, E. Harvey Oswald. The public's hate and dismay were palpable. A massive claim. Indefensible. If I worked for them, I would want to die. Then we bought the keyword famously, which drove people to our website featuring our now infamous tagline and the proof of its promise. A growing list of the 18 lines we win by week's end. After that, we altered our Wikipedia page, added famously to UrbanDictionary.com, gave Failblog the heads up, and when people started creating memes, we tossed a few into the mix. And just for good measure, we flew the misspelled banner again over the palais as everyone gathered for the closing gala. Within three days, the stunt generated over 300,000 tweets, 130,000 Twitter pics of our tag, nearly a million media impressions overall, and a whole industry familiar with what is now the most famous agency tagline in the world. Great, famously and famously affected. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> so the funny thing about that is I always show clients that film because they always say, well, what if we put an ad out and, and the social media environment, you know, turns against us? It's like it happens, you know? I mean, like, the, the social media environment, the digital world will do whatever they want with your brand or your ad. Key is, when it starts to happen, you have to control the whole thing. So we were the laughing stock of the advertising world for a day. We flipped it on its head, um, and it actually turned out to work out for us. Um, so I think that that's a good lesson for all clients when you're messing around in the social media world. Um, wanted to just show you one other thing, because I think it's a great example of taking risks um, and not being afraid to fail. Uh, there's a campaign, campaign that I've been doing for a couple of years for DirecTV um, that I'm sure you guys are aware of. And basically what it does is it, it just bashes their, their enemy. Their enemy is cable television. So in, in America and some other parts of the world, you've got cable, which is about 70% of all households, and you have satellite, which is about 30%. DirecTV is a satellite provider. Um, and so we did a, camp, a campaign for DirecTV, and i got to say, this is the bravest client I've ever worked with in my life. They are amazing. We did a campaign that said nothing about DirecTV, not one thing. It just said how their rival, their enemy, Cable, if you have Cable, your life can spiral out of control. 
therefore you need through FTPs. Not a single product shot, not a single benefit about their product. Simply bashing the competition. It's been the most successful campaign they've ever run. It's been running for over two years now. Um, I'll show you a couple of these spots, I'm sure you know them. When you have cable and can't record all your shows, you feel unhappy. When you feel unhappy, you go to happy hour. When you go to happy hour, you're up for anything. When you're up for anything, you head to a Turkish bathhouse. When you head to a Turkish bathhouse, you meet Charlie Sheen. And when you meet Charlie Sheen, you reenact scenes from Platoon with Charlie Sheen. Don't reenact scenes from Platoon with Charlie Sheen. Get rid of cable and upgrade to direct TV. Don't just watch TV, direct TV. When you wait forever for the cable guy, you get bored. When you get bored, you start staring out windows. When you start staring out windows, you see things you shouldn't see. When you see things you shouldn't see, you need to vanish. When you need to vanish, you fake your own death. When you fake your own death, you dye your eyebrows. And when you dye your eyebrows, you attend your own funeral as a guy named Phil Shifley. Don't attend your own funeral as a guy named Phil Shifley. Get rid of cable and upgrade to Direct TV. Call 1 800 Direct TV.
and sort of like, well, of course, our industry tends to skew young, but really kind of equally across all these generations, we have everywhere working with these people, and we're speaking to these people in advertising. <laughs> so how do, we, how do we make sure that we create an environment that is, that is getting the best out of everybody? It's something that we call radical collaboration. Um, and, and if you look at that, you've all seen this photo before. It's a picture of the internet. But if you look at that, um, it really also looks exactly like the picture of a millennial social graph. Um, and all of our social graphs now as we sort of seep out into social media um, and, and live in the digital world. Um, so how do you make your environment that you work in feel a little bit more like that? So this is just, I mean, this is just one photo. Um, our entire office um, in New York looks like this. Long picnic table style, no walls. I mean, I truly believe that ideas are living or like living organisms. And if you put walls around those, those ideas, they're not going to be able to grow bigger. You take those walls out, you have an idea, they can pop from head to head to head to head from generation to generation. You get that idea, that idea becomes, begins to become much, much bigger. Um, so it's a very, very open, collaborative environment. And we haven't had it. Um, last thing I want to say. Uh, has anybody read this book? Found it? Okay, so I'm not going to say that. Um, but I am going to say uh, that in this whole, I mean, collaboration is such a buzzword now, and it is so important to the creative process. Uh, and, and, and we all know that now. We know how groups and group think can help make an idea bigger. But I think there's a very important piece to the creative process that you have to nurture. Um, and I think it's, there is a time in the creative process where you have to be radically uncollaborative. Okay, so don't worry about what the press says, don't worry about what your boss says, don't worry about what your friends say, right? I've never worked on an idea where it didn't, the germ of that idea didn't start in one person's head. Okay, that's just a fact. That's the way creativity works. That idea might get a lot bigger when you start to collaborate. But you have to allow yourself, and your company has to allow everybody the time to have that one thought in one person's head that's then going to turn into something bigger. That's being radically uncollaborative. That's why we give you three hours to not be with anyone and not have any meetings every single week. This is a really important part of the process uh, that we cannot forget. Um, I hear this a lot, Greg. I hope you guys don't hear this in your, uh, in your agencies and businesses. Um, I'm not creative. Uh, this is a self-fulfilling prophecy, and nobody should ever say this. If you say this, trust me, you will not be creative. Um, and if you say this, by the way, as I started with, there's 1,500 of the world's best CEOs that are looking for one thing in their future leaders, which is creativity. So if you want a job, don't go yelling this off the rooftops. Um, so this is a, and it's a sad statement, and, and I hate when I hear it. And so we really don't allow anybody to say this, great because when I'm talking about the creative environment in our agency, I'm talking about every department. This is not about the creative department. This is about solving problems creatively. That happens in the account group, that happens in the planning group, that happens in the production group, that happens in every single department. Um, and I think that's a really, really probably the most important piece of a creative environment and a creative culture that we're building. So this is the first sign you see when you walk into great. Great people talk about ideas, average people talk about things, small people talk about other people. This is really important in the agency world. There's a lot of bullshit. There's a lot of politics. Um, we drive it out of prey. Uh, it's, it's, there is no need for that. But we're in the business of his ideas. Make no mistake about it. The only reason that you get paid as an agency are your creative ideas. Relationships are great. Um, servicing a client is critically important. But they don't need that. What they need, what businesses need that we offer and they don't have, are these incredibly creative solutions to problems. Um, and that's why they come to us, and that's why they will always come to us. So don't ever, I always tell our people, don't ever forget why we're here and why we get paid. Right? It's that first thing. We talk about ideas. Um, and ideas are what will always matter in our industry. So thanks so much.